want to welcome everybody. I'm Barbara Mataloni uh, with Labor Notes, and uh, I'm excited to be out here in LA with a Labor Notes crew, uh, as well as uh, some allies from the United Caucus of Rank and File Educators. Uh, we've been out here for a week now, uh, uh, supporting the strike. Uh, last week, uh, making doing phone banking and uh, uh, supporting plans for delivery of uh, flyers and uh, signs and getting ready at the picket lines. Um, and it's just been amazing since, uh, I guess it was only since yesterday that the strike began. It, it feels like uh, Jillian's laughing there. It's, it's amazing how much time it feels like has already passed because uh, the, the ground is shifting uh, under us, or certainly under uh, Superintendent Butner, uh, because of the power of the LA teachers. Um, so just a few things in terms of how this is going to work. For those of you who were uh, listening in, uh, you will see, you should see uh, down on your screen, uh, a place for a chat box and a QA. and uh, a We will be taking questions, uh, but what, the way I'd like it to start is, gonna, I have a few questions myself. Uh, for uh, the educators and union members here at UTLA. Probably going to talk about that for about 20, 25 minutes. And then we'll open it up uh, for those of you who are participating. So as you have questions, you can put them uh, in the Q&A uh, or in the chat. Uh, I'll follow through. And uh, when it comes time uh, for you to ask your question, I will let you know uh, that it's your turn. I'll unmute you and you can speak. Uh, please um, keep your questions as questions, uh, and um, it's certainly less than a minute, uh, and then we'll hand those over to the panelists. So um, if everybody's good to go, uh, I have one more thing I need to do. Okay, now we are going to be officially live on uh, Facebook. Uh, so we're getting there. Tick, tick, tick. And there we are. Um, but I do have one more question for my producer, Samantha Winslow. How do I get back to my screen? There we go. All right. We're good to go. All right. So, um, uh, Jillian, you're at the top of my screen, uh, so I'll invite you to start off first by just introducing yourself, who you are, where you teach, how long you've been a union member, if you have a specific role in the union, uh, say that, and then we'll go to Mark and then Carla, and then let's hear about the strike. Go ahead, Jillian. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Jillian Russom. I've been teaching high school history in LA for 18 years um, and pretty much been active in the union for that whole time. Um, and now I represent the East Area on the union's board of directors. Great. Mark. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Mark Ramos. I am a high school history teacher. I've been teaching for 11 years. I've been involved in the union for all 11 years, and now I'm a, on the board of directors representing North Area. Great. Thank you. And Carla. I'm, I'm Carla Griego. I teach high school. I am on the board of directors for UTLA and I'm also area chair. Great. And I've been teaching for 15 years. All right. Uh, well, want to thank uh, the three of you very much for being on with us. I know it's been a very intense uh, couple of months and certainly an incredibly intense uh, last week for all of you uh, as you prepare for this strike. Maybe you could start off by just uh, giving some context here. What's this strike about? What are, why are you on strike? What, do you, what are your demands? Just jump. Carla, go for it. Well, um, we've got a long, um, a lot of demands on this strike. In fact, that's one of the things that we often talk about is how many things we put on our, on our bar, at the bargaining table. From, um, we started off uh, with demands around work issues, salary, and then we expanded those demands to include some community demands. We had many discussions around bargaining for the common good, and um, we arrived 
um, at the decision that those were things that, that were very worthy uh, to fight for our students. We knew all along that we had to do it, but to put it to the table um, and, and really go fighting for immigrant rights for the end to random searches, which is something that came out of, of students, came from students demanding that. And we felt that was very important to include that. Um, we, uh, community schools is another big demand. And then we started also looking at testing and over testing and how that impacts instruction and particular students like kids in special education or English language learners. So we added things around testing, things that the district does not wanna negotiate on, but that we know as educators are very um, important uh, because they impact students' learning and they take away resources and just how costly they are. So those, um, and then of course we have um, salary, uh, we have working conditions, class size is one of our major ones. Um, we have a clause in our contract, it's called section 1.5, that although we have these, I guess, somewhat decent caps or, or class size numbers in our contract, there is this section that says that if the district has financial, is under financial stress, they have the authority to not abide by the contract um, class size. So they've had that and they've used it forever, ever since they put it in there. So that's a very important one that we want to make sure it's off mm -hmm. and out of the contract. Uh, I'll, I'll give space for other folks to add to this. I don't want to take it off. Great, thank you. So, so um, Mark, if you want to jump in. I would also add to that that uh, it, one of our calls in our uh, negotiation is the end of privatization of uh, the public school system in uh, LAOSD. I think in the past couple of years, there has been a 287% growth in charter schools, unregulated charter schools in Los Angeles. And the district fails to um, collect money from, from those charter schools, uh, from charter schools, and which is costing the district Six hundred million dollars that could be used for for public schools. And Jillian, did you want to add anything to that? Um, just just really quick. I mean, to give people an idea of we're what we're talking about, um, we're just talking about decades of um, conditions getting worse and worse in the schools. And so, it is very very common in secondary schools to have 40, 43, 46 students in a class. Um, which is just absolutely outrageous. And the, we've talked about how 80% of our elementary schools have no full-time nurse um, and counselors are working with 950 students. Um, and, and our school district is 85% black and brown students. Um, we've seen that the dramatic underfunding of our schools um, has happened in California in the last four decades as the number of students of color has grown. So we actually see a willful um, disrespect and abandonment of students of color. Um, and, and these conditions are outrageous. And we've put up with them and put up with them because teachers do that. They try to make it work. And I think this is really this outpouring of saying we're not going to allow that uh, anymore for our students or ourselves. Great, thanks. So just uh, again, uh, this is Barbara Mataloni and I'm with Labor Notes. We're here uh, at the United Teachers of Los Angeles uh, in LA, uh, speaking to three educators and union members uh, from UTLA who are deep in the struggle here in this absolutely critical uh, strike. Uh, and we've heard a little bit just now from Julia, Jillian about sort of like that this strike is the result of decades of an assault on public education in LA, and in particular, uh, we understand that assault to be an assault on black and brown children and their communities with the underfunding of schools. And you know what we heard from Mark and Carla then is uh, that, that with an understanding of that context that the demands for this strike um, go way beyond salary and health benefits, although the, that's part of it, uh, but are really demands that encompass uh, bargaining for the common good, bargaining beyond uh, salary and wages to include uh, uh, accountability for charter schools, 
uh, to have the, the district take, uh, invest in, in the resources in community schools um, to look at and, and uh, stop uh, the random searches of students, uh, issues relative to immigrant rights. Uh, so really broadening the scope of bargaining uh, and, and, um, and saying we want more for our students and for ourselves. So that's where we are in terms of the demands. We're going to get back to that a little bit because I know we have a question about that. We'll come back to that. Uh, but I think part of what uh, people probably want to hear right now is you went out on strike yesterday morning. You had to delay the strike. Uh, you had planned to go out last Thursday. Uh, so you got yourselves four more days uh, to plan and four more days uh, to get anxious. Uh, but you went out yesterday, um, had two great rallies. Um, like to hear from you about what it's been like to be out there on the picket lines. And you got to jump in. <laughs> it's a, uh, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Um, I'll go and then Mark and then Jillian. How about we keep it like that? Um, so it's been amazing. I mean, we knew it, we read about this. You know, it's happened in the past and we've seen it with the other strikers across the country. But being in it is just incredible. Um, we've been doing circles at my school in between activities. So we pick it, then we do a circle, and then we go to the citywide action. We eat lunch together, and then we circle. And everybody has been talking about um, how they've been, uh, it's been bringing them back just their previous knowledge and understanding of labor of uh, social justice movements and how they have been feeling reignited. And some folks have said, I have been feeling like I've been doing things, but I haven't felt power. And now I feel power. And it's, so it's really a magical thing that is happening among people uh, to see the solidarity from um, the community is amazing. I mean, it's just nonstop love or teachers as we're walking down streets we don't even have our picket signs and people are just supporting us and honking just because we know Metro is allowing us to go on for free buses are free uh, parks are opening their door it's just amazing it's built such incredible community and it I think that uh, the city which is something that I don't know if you know, didn't expect this the city is showing their love for educators and it's a wonderful wonderful feeling um and so i think we're everybody knows that we're in it until we get a settlement that is good for our students and that is what we talk about on a regular basis so that you know we can every day we know it's a fight it's a fight but we know we're doing it for our students and we believe that it is we are going to win there's this faith that we're gonna... Mark, what's it been like for you and the picket lines where you've been? Uh, so it's been also amazing. It's been great. Uh, my three-year-old son comes with me in the morning at 6.30 in the morning every, every strike day. Uh, there's been some community members, some folks on the line that walked the line in 89 and came back to walk with us in 2019. Um, so seeing at the school side, it's been so much parent support, community support, but when I go to the bigger rallies, it really shows the sheer numbers of support and teachers that are out there that are fighting for what's right for our students. And if you see any of the aerial pictures, it's, we're pretty much shutting downtown LA for the teachers. For the students for our communities and seeing those aerial pictures it's it's almost like jaw dropping and we're doing it in downpour and it's raining and there's still 50,000 people out there for for the schools today the second day same thing we're from the charter school association 50,000 teachers again and at some point i heard that the uh, lapd stopped counting because they don't want to count after 50,000 <laughs> Don't want to count 50,001. Yes. Uh, 
So, so, so uh, Jillian, I want to hear from you, but I also want you to start sort of talking and thinking a little bit and pick up on something that Carla said, uh, or two things that she said. One is uh, the experience of power, that the people really feeling their power and feeling their power, certainly as Mark says, like I was out there yesterday, 50,000 people, that's, that's powerful. <laughs> and, uh, and dancing today to Ozo Motley with 50,000 people was another kind of power. Uh, but I'm interested in, um, in how you helped to bring people to a place where they could feel that power. Uh, you know, I, as an educator myself, I know lots and lots of teachers feel pretty powerless day in and day out in their classroom uh, because of the assault that they're experiencing. So as we continue talking, I'd really appreciate it if you could start to help us understand how we got to this place. But Jillian, you, you, you speak, if you want to speak first to the picket line, you go for that too. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, there's, there's so many stories. I mean, a 30,000 person dance party in front of the California Charter Schools Association is a pretty, it's not a bad day. Um, and then we filtered through the streets and basically there were like impromptu music bands throughout all of downtown where school groups were like, forming their own performances and getting down with their chants. And um, it, it's just awesome. I had a coworker bring uh, three daughters with him yesterday to the picket line. And I basically saw them start their own game of picket line where they're all <laughs> chanting si se puede and jumping in rain puddles. And like, this is what young people are learning right now. So the, the Oaxacan chant um, that, you know, teachers fighting are also teaching is like very deeply felt on the picket lines right now in LA. Um, and um, I, I think that it's, there's a lot more stories I would love to tell, but as far as how we got to this point, um, um, it, it, I think for those of us that have been doing this work for so long, we've been incredibly emotional because of realizing how we see fruition of a, what a lot of what felt like you know, late nights and long meetings for so long. Um, but um, just to, I mean, there, there's a long history of how we transformed our union. Um, certainly the Chicago strike um, gave us a new energy behind that, or, although our caucus had existed for a long time. We created a, a motion for all members to vote on. We have the ability to do that, um, which said we need a campaign for the schools our students deserve. We said we need to reframe what we're doing as a union. Um, and this was back in um, about 2013 um, that we did that. And that was the launching pad for running a new group of people to lead the union. Um, and there's any number of steps we had to take to retool the organization. Um, but I think there's, there's three that stand out to me. Um, and all three of these, we actually had to fight around. You know, there were political disagreements in the union. One of them is the idea that we're going to create these cat teams, right, which we got from Chicago, that at every school, it's not going to be one leader. Um, we're going to need like a one to 10 ratio so that union can become about those conversations um, of what we're up against and why it matters to you. Um, so I have, I'm at a big high school that used to just have one chapter chair putting memos in people's boxes. And now we have 13 people that go around to the, to the part of the school that they work in and they talk to their colleagues on a regular basis to get them involved. Um, another one would be parent and community work and making that a priority. Um, and I know we'll come back to that, but there was a fight around that. There were people that said with Janice coming, hey, we're going to lose money. We can't afford parent and community organizers. And we fought for that. We said, without that, we will lose. Um, and then another one being um, fighting racism and putting that at the forefront of what we do as a union. Um, so for example, we as a union stood with Black Lives Matter over the past several years. And when students started um, fighting for Black Lives Matter in schools, we stood with students. Um, while some in our union said, um, you know, we actually held a rally with police um, around more police for school safety. And we said, no, that's not where we want to stand. I um, mean, we won that argument. 
And so we're able to put forward the demands against random searches. We're able to say, this is a strike for racial justice. Um, and we've really kind of won that argument. So those are just a few things, but I'm sure others can add to that. So I, um, I see a question being posted that I'm gonna ask now, uh, cause I think it's, it's relevant and, and interesting in terms of sort of the detail about how you built this power. Uh, so to any of you who could answer this, but uh, the question, um, I'm trying to see who it's from here, uh, is um, asking uh, Carol uh, Churchill, is asking, um, how did you actually move from having one chapter chair to having one to 10 ratio? Like that, like we can say, yeah, have one one to 10 ratio. And then uh, you go to do it and it's not so easy. So I don't know if uh, Mark or Carla can speak to that uh, since we, um, or if we wanna go back to Jillian, but I'd be interested in sort of, what was that like at the building level? to develop those, those new leaders? So as far as building those new leaders, we needed to, to teach or and give teachers the tools of an organizer. And we made a concerted effort to try to train, to train chapter chairs to be kind of leads and then train the folks that they felt that they could identify as leaders to be their organizers. Um, and it, it, it was hard. I mean, it's in practice, it takes a lot more than just all oh, of these are our 10 people. And we, throughout the past couple of years, when we started, when we decided to create this uh, contract action team structure, we practiced and we did, we used these methods of communication to try to, to prepare for, for this week. And it was wonky at first, but as, as we practice and as we can see in the numbers on Monday and today, those contract action teams have worked. Cool. Um, Carla, do you wanna add anything in terms of what it was like at your building site as you were really working to transform the union and have more rank and file and active, activity and participation. Yeah, I mean, I think that it came from trying to build structures that could be functional during a strike. But I also think in some areas, it was also a way for to expand leadership and build new leadership. Because prior to that, our, our chapters were organized in a way that everything was went through the chapter chair. And so there wasn't a lot of um, involvement from the members with um, the union as a whole. It was mostly the chapter chair doing the work and they just gave information to the um, members. And they, um, so in some areas and particularly in our area, we, in the same area that Mark and I are in, mm -hmm. we try to do it so that people actually did become their own leaders as well. And in some areas, I think Jillian can speak to that. I think it was like expanding the role of the steering committee in some schools. They already had steering committees, but now what does this cat team do that is different or adds to uh, the steering committee? So I think that was another, um, uh, thing that happened with the cat teams, which I think has really helped because now people are stepping in to leadership roles. So for example, at my school, it started as we just barely started organizing last year. Um, they just barely got a chapter chair last year. I came in this year. And um, I mean, today when we were in circle, that was a big part of the discussion was, okay, the chapter chair and Carla have work to do after the strike after the picket line. So how are others here in this circle when they start seeing themselves as, I, you know, I never saw myself in this position and, um, but I, I can see myself now. And, and I said, you know, I tell them sometimes it's just speaking up and, and giving a, a suggestion that could begin that, that, um, that road toward you taking on more leadership role. So I think that that was a beautiful thing about the CAD was when it set up a structure, but it also empowered people to step in and, 
and become more involved in the union in different ways than that they had before. So um, I've actually been really interested in that as I've been out here just for the past seven days. Uh, and because the structures that you've created uh, around the strike are just phenomenal. I mean, in, in terms of the sort of the, the various levels of communication just to like just to carry off the strike. Right. Like in, in terms of who's responsible for what, where, who's counting, who's on the picket line. Who's got the materials there that you need? Who's reporting back to whom? Where is that happening? Uh, and, and really clear communication with people. But I've also been thinking as well about your point, Carla, which is sort of how do those structures um, work so that they actually are developing leaders and are going to sustain the work beyond the strike? Uh, so that it, it's not just, yeah, we got this done and we got it done really like damn damn well and it's impressive uh and and that's part of why i'm interested to go back and you know what are the kinds of things you did to build to get here uh and so i hear about the cat teams i hear directly about leadership development and sort of an intentionality about that uh to, to identify leaders um are there other things that you've done and and both within the union and then uh, to extend within to the, into the community because I know there's also tremendous community support. So I don't know if any of you want to speak to either part of that, like other things that you've done as union members at the building site and, and or things that you've done that have started to bring the community in. Um, I could, um, I just wanted to add on about, you know, developing more leaders at the school site. Um, when, I, when I think about it, um, actually, I think it's the content that drives the structure. That is, um, if you're never talking to members about anything, then what's the need to have a one to 10 communication ratio because you're not talking to members about anything. I think what drove the urgency and actually got people to step up is that we started talking to members about a whole lot more stuff that people wanted to talk about. And then there's actually a reason why um, you need that ratio. So for example, like, um, you know, Eli Brode had a secret plan to get half of our students into charters within um, eight years. We were like, the whole membership needs to know about that and talk about that. What is going on with billionaires and there are efforts to transform our district. Um, you know, we, we, we saw Janice coming and we were like, we need to have a talk with members about why there's an attack on our unions and, and why we actually want them to pay more dues. Um, and that means we got to talk about what our union does and what it's going to do in the future. And so, so that then creates the sense that like, yeah, so as far as the structure, like I'm at a big high school and so ours is broken up by buildings and floors, right? Because in your normal day, you can't possibly get to talk to people on the other side of campus. Elementary schools, a lot of times it's by either the grade level, like, oh, all the fourth graders need a point person or the lunch time that they have. So then you can approach people who haven't done much and just be like, you know what? We really need um, the third grade team to kind of be informed, would you be willing to share that information and get their feedback? And then there's a real reason behind it um, and, and, an, and an urgency behind it. Um, and um, we have um, encouraged and um, done trainings and, and had conversations about making parent outreach um, a part of your school site union work um, and we've been talking about that luckily for years. Um, it did take really quite a while um, to transform that into uh, feeling like a part of people's union work. Um, and uh, I can let other folks uh, talk about that a little bit more. Um, I would like to share a little bit about some of the emerging parent leaders that I work with, but if there's time. Yeah, I'd like to actually hear uh, some of that. Uh, so, Mark, do you want to tell us some, can you speak a little bit to the issue of how, how the community was brought into the struggle? Um, well, our, 
teachers are also heavily involved in their community, are part of organizations, are part of churches, are part of all these things outside of, of teaching. And we tried to pull on those. So at some point, at one point, it was maybe five months leading up to the strike. I was running trainings with community groups to partner up with, with the universities to, to send students, to send community members, to pick sites that they would all send community orgs to and, and students to support the teachers. Um, and I know that some uh, folks I've been working with have also been in contact with those kind of creating cat structures, structures, but with the community too, so that the community can connect with someone on staff or a, or a UTLA member to get folks to, to specific areas that may need more support than others. So, so I, I, uh, Jillian was just talking about, and I'm really interested in this part as well, like the sort of direct political education that the union has done with members that, um, you know, talking about Eli Broad and his plan uh, for the um, Los Angeles public schools and being very direct about like there, there are people out there who are looking to undermine our unions, to undermine public education. Here's who they are. This is how this works. Um, and I'm, I'm interested in, in, you know, how those conversations went uh, with the members, because sometimes, uh, sometimes people will think that's too sort of far away and not immediate enough for membership. So I'm wondering about um, how it was that that became so real for members and certainly see it out on the, in the rallies, everybody's got signs about privatization, so it's, it's been effective. And then as well, I'm curious about how you did that with the community. How, how was the community educated about uh, the, the assault uh, on the public schools and come to understand this as a fight uh, that is a fight against privatizers to preserve public education? Can you talk some about the political education on, in, in those different places? So I, as far as our members, I think it's been easy for us to bring in that political education. We see it every, every day. With, since 2008, like I said earlier, two, the charter schools have grown 287% in LAUSD. What that means is less students, less funding. That means, that means our public schools are surrounded by charter schools and charter schools are being sucked or are sucking students. Like at my old school, right before testing, all the special, special education students would be come back to our schools because they would be kicked out by the charter schools. And then we would see this massive influx of students right before testing or in the beginning of the school year, we don't see much, that many students. Like we, because of those, real effects of charter schools, it has been easier for us to talk about the privatization question because, because we feel it every day. And it, it gives, because of that, it's easier for us to, to teach about that because it's in the teachers every day. So that's gotta be a real challenge then to work with the community around that as well, as especially given the degree to which parents are being um, you know, in, encouraged to think about charter schools uh, like it, as the place to go uh, for, for their kids. So how, did, how can any of you talk a little bit about the, uh, the community education around the privatization efforts? I can, I can uh, begin that. Um, I think like um, Mark shared how teachers feel it, the same thing started happening with parents because of co-location. So basically schools that have empty spaces, I think the magic number is six empty classrooms. Uh, once that happens, the charter school can come in and Oh, Carla, you're frozen. Worse and where's where we started getting, sorry. As more and more people, more uh, doing, 
people, um, the, the schools started feeling it because then uh, they were coming in to take up spaces that were very valuable to the school site, like the computer lab or the parent center or the room where the school psychologists met with students. So people started really feeling it. The other thing is that they weren't carrying their weight in the school site. Um, in some schools, it, like on the west side, I've heard stories from parents where it was a very segregated um, space, not only like by charter, but the kids, for example, one of the schools in the West area, um, the, the uh, public school was predominantly black and the charter school was predominantly white, like European white, like uh, German or something, I don't know. But um, it was, and they got all the nice space. They had everything actually looked better for them than it did for the public school that didn't have all the resources. So pe the parents started feeling that. And so what was needed was um, a leadership and like you said, that education. And so connecting it back to when this new uh, UTLA leadership came in, we prioritized spending um, money on a uh, parent uh, and community organizer. We have two parent and community organizers who developed a, a program or um, a presentation that they started taking to some of these school sites that were co-located and parents or that were about to be co-located. It started organizing with parents to fight back that co-location. And in the process of organizing in that fight, they started the political education. I've been able to participate in some of those presentations as a person who is listening to the presentation and, and speaking. And it's really amazing how they've been able to break down this privatization process. And it really makes it very accessible to parents. And so I think that started happening and it was a very focused um, group in East Area. They did a lot of work out of that. Uh, Jillian can speak more to this. Um, a, a, an anti-privatization parent group arose in my area. Um, another organization started working with us around that and same thing, a, a parent group that is focused on um, anti-privatization arose. But it was, it was, it started at these schools that were being co-located. And I think that experiencing the injustice of that is what at least opened people's minds to this. And really, and for our teachers, it also empowered them because what, be, prior to this leadership, I remember working with teachers who were co-located and they were angry and they felt like the union wasn't doing anything about it. And so once the new leadership came in and took on that, they started getting more involved as well. Go ahead, Jillian, you look like you wanted to add something there. Yeah, I think, I mean, Carla really laid out the process really well. And, and just to underscore, like, I would say a lot of our leading parent activists across the city are these um, parents who emerged to fight against a charter coming in to take space at their campus. But then they realize, even if we fight so hard that we push the charter school out, it basically goes down the street and locates at another neighborhood school because this is allowed. Um, and I just want to say, like, we did come up with uh, one of the early trainings for parents on what is privatization, and it really hadn't been done before. Like, we, you know, we parents had been engaged in how to fight off a charter at their school, but not in the bigger picture. And so I, I just think part of the lesson is that Parents are really interested in political education and understanding what is behind this. Who are who are these rich people? Who are these corporations that have this um, plan for this? You know, my child's school. And so, just don't underestimate the desire among parents and community to to um, learn that stuff. And then those moms literally um, have completely run with it. They go to school to school to organize other. Uh, moms. They take on corporate figures in our city. Um, so it, it's a beautiful thing to see that um, flowering. And, and I, I just want to sort of pull out for everybody that I think what's really what I'm hearing uh, both for the, the union members, the educators, and for the parents and community around the political education is that it started because 
around things that people were really experiencing. I think Mark, you say it like really clearly, like people feel the lack of funds in their school. They feel that every day that the resources are not there. The parents experience the co-location as taking resources away from their, the, their child in their child's school. And so the political education didn't just sort of come out of nowhere, but it grew from the struggles and was woven into the struggle is what I'm hearing you saying. I, is that accurate? Cool. All right. So I do want to make sure we have some time uh, for some questions and we've got some up here. Um, so I might just, uh, just start out uh, with the Q and A's. We've got, a, and, and I'll just sort of run down the list. Um, so Kayla Mock, uh, has a question, and um, I'm going to see if I can uh, have you answer this question live, Kayla, if I can figure out how to do this. And if I can't, I'll just read Kayla's question so we don't lose time. Uh, and I'm just going to uh, answer. So Kayla wants to know, uh, she says, hi, Solidarity from Virginia. Can you talk a little bit more about the demand that came from students regarding random searches? Carla, you had mentioned that. Yeah, so, um, so there is a group here called Students Deserve that is a grassroots um, organization made up of students teachers and parents and several years ago i don't remember if it was four years ago or five years ago we were doing these um there's a funding formula here that um it supposedly gets um it requires that there is parent and student input and teacher input so several years ago we took the opportunity to host some of these and utla hosted some of these meetings parents and students, and students deserve, did it as well. And out of these meetings, um, and along with the, the fight that was going on here with Black Lives Matter, um, with the local Black Lives Matter organization, and other organizations that were fighting against um, the um, school to prison pipeline, um, this uh, issue um, in our school district of random searches came up, where we are only 4%, uh, there are only 4% of school districts in the United States who have random searches. And it means that they pull your students out. It's supposed to be random. They have a wand and they wand the students. And, um, and then they put them, they take them back in. And this begins at the sixth grade level. And um, as students started talking about this, they started sharing their stories of how it made them feel. Um, they talked about how they felt like they were already in jail before they, you know, wherever, before they even got that the people who were doing this were their counselors. And how could they trust their counselors when their counselors were treating them in this manner? So they started organizing around it. And they've done an immense job for several years now going to the school board and talking about it, um, urging them to end it. Uh, just recently, there were some um, some town hall meetings. I think there is a, a task force was created by the city attorney, and it involved some uh, members of the community as well as the city attorney, and they were done throughout the city. Students deserve students participated in one of them, and from that, the city attorney said that it made no sense that this would happen and urged the district to stop it. However, the district continues to invest in it in, um, in making sure this happens. Uh, but it's, it's one of the demands that we have on our contract. And it, what the beautiful thing is that, and you guys can share this, but at one of our, um, when we first started talking about random searches within our, our leadership, our board, some board members were like, ah, oh, you know, sure it happens, but, and it kind of connected to what Jillian shared earlier about how there was this, this, um, this trepidation that's getting involved deep. And so, 
started uh, preparing to go to China maybe two weeks or three weeks, people on our board of directors seeing the need to lift of ending random searches. So I am hey, Carla, hopeful Carla, that Carla, this ends because... Carla, you're breaking up a little bit. Um, so I'm going to move on and hope we can get you back and have you not be frozen. Hello. Uh, there. Uh, and, and actually, I'm going to ask another question. I'm going to ask I another you were all frozen. <laughs> I'm going to ask another question that's, I think, relevant to what you were saying when you started uh, breaking up. Uh, and this is a question from George Luce. And he says, uh, regarding your move to become a racial justice union, can you talk a bit more about the nature of the resistance and over how you overcame that resistance? So maybe we could hear from uh, Mark or Jillian about that. Or not. <laughs> sure, I mean- Is this uh, the nature of the resistance in the union? Is that- Yeah, I think that's what he's asking for, yeah. Um, so one um, moment within that, um, and and I'll think about it a little bit more, but um, uh, when the school shootings happened and there was, you know, this dialogue about what is it that makes schools safe, um, folks, basically opposition against union power, um, there had always been sort of an undertone of we need to stick more to basic member interests. And I know all of us see that in our unions, right? We see some group that says, you know, we need to focus on member issues and benefits. Um, and some of these other social justice things may sound nice, but they're not the core business of the union. So that, that sort of sentiment has always existed among a more conservative layer um, of our union. Um, but when the school shootings happened, I think people jumped on the sort of national panic for, um, um, and, you know, and the, there was obviously fear around it. Um, and, um, I also recall that, uh, it was, it was a very, there was a very cynical opposition within our union, um, that wanted to pit wanted to ally with the school police union um, and capitalize on the fact that the school police union was criticizing us um, because we've called for, um, you know, ending random searches and we've called for um, ending the school to prison pipeline. Um, and so I think a, a very cynical opposition in the union basically tried to ally with the school police um, and thought that they would sort of expose union power or something um, as um, not not caring about school safety. Um, but um, because of the courageous work that Carla just really well described, um, these students' voices were already out there. And they were saying that being searched and then having to feel humiliated and walk back into my algebra class like I'm a criminal that doesn't make me feel safe in my school. In fact, it makes me feel like I have no one I can trust. Um, and, it, and then we were able to connect that with all the research that was coming out about how more criminalization in schools um, does not make kids safer. And um, I mean, it's really because the kids were self-organizing um, and right around, just after those school shootings, the kids had a massive town hall on making Black Lives Matter in schools. So. Um, you know, uh, luckily we had as a union come out squarely with them and, um, were able to put their voices in the forefront. Uh, so I don't know, hopefully that answers your question. Uh, can I also add? Yeah, please do. Mark. Um, I think also there's been like a mindset shift of what it, or of what a union is. I feel like previously a lot of folks have seen the union as a service model type of union. This is what the union does for me. Let's file it. If something bad happens, let's file a grievance. And there's been a change with union power coming in and folks changing the way the union union's mindset is and turning it into an organizing union. So instead of waiting for the grievance to happen and 
and figuring out what happens later. Instead, we're trying to organize, organize around it to change the conditions in the first place so we don't have to file a grievance. Uh, one of the ways is like also getting people to see that they have power in organizing with stopping co-locations, getting bad, rid of bad principles. And I feel like once, once union members saw the power and were able to win organizing, their ideas of what a union does or can do has changed over time. So that, that brings me to two questions that I think I'll put together because um, we're going to be getting close to, to wrapping up. Uh, so I'll put these together. And, and, and one comes from uh, Shira Cohen. Uh, hi, Shira, in uh, Philadelphia. And uh, she says, how have you raised expectations for rank and file members who may have only experienced a traditional business model union? How do you train rank and file members, not just leaders in buildings, to be organizers? And then with that, um, I have to find this other question. I think the other question I had inadvertently had deleted, uh, so I don't know who uh, put it up there. Uh, but it was a question about what the role of staff was in the transformation of the union uh, and if staff was resistant or, or not. And um, so as you think about how you want to tackle those questions, I just want to clarify uh, for those of you who are listening uh, that union power uh, was the caucus that elected new leadership, that elected as new leadership in UTLA in 2014. Uh, and what we're seeing today um, with the strike and what you're hearing uh, from these union members uh, when they talk about union power, when they talk about new uh, leadership, that's what they're talking about. Uh, union power is a caucus uh, that uh, had elected leadership and has been working to transform the UTLA. So do any of you want to jump on the, how did this happen? How do you raise expectation for rank and file members and, uh, and or uh, the staff role in that? Just go, Carly. I can, I can give it a try. Oh, Carla, do you want to go? You go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. All right. There's a lot in there. I mean, um, I I think um, it's what's so awesome about having a lot of strikes is that the real world raises expectations in ways that, like, you know, your best union program can't do. And so for that, I I mean, again, I think we kind of have to go back to Chicago. Um, once we had that to point to, which was so different than what we'd been used to, it was a strike for one thing. And second of all, it was framed around justice. It was framed around what students deserve. I mean, once you have that, then we, I mean, when union power ran for office, I mean, that was kind of what we ran on. Um, and so we, we ran with a program of pretty high expectations what we needed to be able to fight for and fight against. Um, and then basically we're plunged into a contract campaign in the first year of the new group taking office. So we had, um, we, you know, we had to organize escalating actions, which had never happened before. I mean, we had had one-off rallies, you know, but es uh, uh, escalating actions leading into our contract of 2015 um, which included um, the first mass rally of our membership in downtown LA to actually everyone see each other and see their collective power. Um, and, and those were, those were some of the, of the things. Um, and um, as far as the role of staff, um, <clears throat> absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely, there was resistance and debates um, around uh, the role of staff. Um, we had never had, I mean, I don't, it, it was all over the place. There was no clearly defined, um, you know, work plan or level of responsibility for each staff member. Staff kind of just did their own thing and mostly sat in their offices. And when expectations change dramatically that they should be spending most of their time um, in the schools. 
and that we would no longer have a divide because we used to have a divide where it was like these people are contract enforcement people and these people are are you know help with organizing sometimes um that was like no actually everybody's an organizer um we 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 had folks um really push back against that we had folks leave we had folks push back against it um and we had debates among the staff themselves um so i i i don't i it was not easy um but because i think because we showed real success and power in that first contract fight in 2015 um i think it kind of um it's an example that that staff began to see could actually work and of course we brought on board a lot of amazing um, organizers as well so oh, oh, can I also real quick Margaret, because we're going to start we actually okay. have to wrap up soon but go ahead okay. go mark um i think as far as staff once there's once we as a union changed to a organizing union it attracted staff people wanted to be in this fight and people that have been on strike before and been part of other unions wanted to be here because they could see the writing on the walls and staff has played an important role in the past couple days or in leading up to these past couple days because we wouldn't be at the 50,002 if our staff weren't on point and ready to organize also. Awesome. Can I have one thing? Yes. <laughs> the, the, last, the last, last, Carla. Go ahead. Okay, just last thing. I wanted to talk just personally that, the, that what Jillian was sharing about when the LA, um, the platform and that motion that was passed at, um, at our area meetings, that's when I started getting involved. That's when I started feeling like this is where I want to be. When I went to that first leadership conference and we said that we were building a movement, that's when I took off with being more involved in the union. And I'll never forget that moment. And I think that it was because we shifted and there were many people like me in the union that this platform and the way we were moving forward brought, um, brought a lot more people in. Awesome. Uh, I hate to even have to wrap up, uh, but I also know y'all need to get some sleep because uh, uh, we got to be out on the picket lines early tomorrow morning. Uh, but the one, and there are great questions out there. I'm sorry for those of you who posted questions that we haven't had an opportunity to uh, answer. Um, but I would like to hear from each of the three of you, like 10 seconds. Um, what can people who are not in LA do to support the strike? What, what, what's been meaningful for you in terms of what's out there? Go. M Mark. Um, I think for my staff, when, I, when I'm on the picket line, they always talk about on their social media when other folks post about our strike when other folks share our videos, when, when they see people from across the nation talking about what we're doing in LA, I think it gives uh, people an emergence of like, it's bigger than, than just here. It's bigger than just LA and the, that they know that all of the nation is supporting, supporting them. So if you can post up on social media, uh, UTLA, Red for Ed, all those hashtags, uh, post your support. That would be helpful for, for some folks. Great. Jillian? Um, uh, California Educators Rising, um, check them out on Facebook. They created a spreadsheet for Adopt a School. And that's not just for California schools. If you're a, an educator and your school hasn't adopted a, a school, there may still be schools to be adopted and develop a relationship there. Um, the uh, people probably know Alliance to Reclaim Our Schools created a solidarity fund. Um, and there's also the Tacos for Teachers Fund, which uh, if, if there's too much money left that, you know, to, if we can't buy that many tacos, all that money goes back into the UTLA Solidarity Fund as well. Um, people, I mean, it does make people feel good. So just to add those things. Carla. I was going to say lunch. <laughs> we've been adopted and we've been so grateful. Duarte, 
Nation has been feeding us this past few days, and we are so grateful to them. And uh, we are connecting via Facebook, sending pictures of us on the picket line, eating our lunch, and then sending us solidarity <laughs> pictures. It really lifts us up. So if you can adopt. Okay, it looks like we lost Carla one more time. Uh, but if you can adopt the school, that would be great. I think that's what she was going to say. All right, uh, again, thank you, Mark, Jillian, Carla. Uh, thank you to UTLA um, uh, for your incredible leadership on this. We all understand that this is a fight that's not only for the LA public schools, uh, but when you win and you're gonna win, uh, it's, gonna, it, it's gonna be important for um, public schools, uh, for, for uh, union members in public schools, and I actually think for the public sector. Uh, I, I, there's a huge fight, uh, and we're, we're with you. Uh, we all know that uh, when we fight, we win. Uh, so let's go out and win this. So have a good night. Thanks very much. Let's go get them. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.